Welcome. I'm Jennifer Syme, Executive Director of the Book Club of California, and it's really exciting to have you all here tonight. The seed for this evening was planted about a year ago when um, printer and volunteer, benefactor, and great friend of the book club, Norman McKnight, first introduced us to David Johnston and Mark Saragianis of Prototype Press and urged Mark and David to become members of the book club and urged our librarian, Henry Snyder, to take a look at their work and purchase some for our library. Shortly after that, we had an event that's now become an annual tradition, the Bay Area Student Book Arts Showcase, where we invite book arts programs from all over the Bay Area to nominate some of their top students, and we give them a showcase and let them present about their work and are all energized and excited by the passion and enthusiasm that these young artists are bringing to the book. And it occurred to me, the, the sort of um, proximity of those two events, it occurred to me we needed an event like that for printers, people working with edition books and small publishers. We, put a, we started looking around for who to invite, and David Johnson was particularly enthusiastic about this and gave us a number of your names um, and a number of people that we should really look at, and we realized how rich this was. We were, probably as many of you were, shocked and, and deeply saddened by David's untimely death. But the fact that we're all here tonight, that you're here tonight, I, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for. And I think of this as a celebration of uh, David's own talents and in, in, on, in honor of his memories. In addition to being a very exciting evening to see all of this incredible work, it's, it's really invigorating. If you're not already a member of the book club, uh, you should be. I hope you'll take our uh, upcoming calendar of events and a membership brochure, find out more about us and join us and make this your book club too. Your input and suggestions and your work is important to making our second century strong and vital. So thank you for being here tonight. Tonight we're gonna let each of the featured presses have an opportunity to speak about their own work. Uh, in the interest of time and letting everybody have an equal amount of time, we ask that you refrain from asking questions until the end. I'm not going to do a formal introduction of each group, but we've put on each chair an introduction to each press, and hopefully you were able to talk to the printers a little bit ahead of time. <coughs> to start us off tonight, please join me in welcoming printer, bookbinder, and typecaster, Mark Saragianis, who, with David Johnston, co-founded the Prototype Press. Thank you, guys. This is really nice to see all the other presses here tonight. We, me and David, try to always tried to visit as many presses in the area, and it's just amazing that you know I come to this and realize how many more there are out there that we didn't that we didn't get to see, and it is really an amazing area to do this in. Um, so this is about the prototype press, and I wanted to uh, talk about its originator with David um, in the Sharp Teeth Press, where this kind of got started. Um, on, on October 3rd of last year, David passed away totally unexpectedly, and it was a pretty, am pretty amazing shock to all of us. Um, uh, he was pretty well loved around the area and really full of life and definitely inspired me to, to do this on a real legitimate level, and I don't think I would have really tackled it if it wasn't for him and his starting of uh, the Sharp Teeth Press. This is some early early pictures of him in his garage in the sunset, which was a really fun couple of years. Um, he bought that Vandercook, that giant Vandercook uh, that used to be kind of traveled around the Bay Area for a while before it ended up at the Hicks Brothers. And David, with very little money or real plan, decided that that's what he needed and uh, decided, just bought it and decided to start printing books and art prints. and. Um, really making it happen. And I, I didn't really know too many people. I came from a different part of the country to come work here. And no one I knew was really willing to bite the bullet this hard to go into um, printing books in this traditional manner. Uh, you know, you, you hear about, you know, the old, the old classics and how this is such a hub for the history here. But I didn't know anyone that was really willing to, to do it, to like kind of sacrifice money and time and you know everything they had to go do it so once I met David it was pretty clear cut that we had to go forward because yeah I needed a partner and so that's us and it was a <laughs> it was a Davy sized press it was a very large press and um but it it really allowed us to do all sorts of things um in terms of book printing we could print a book um eight up um 
and we could do giant art prints. And a lot of what David did was invite artists into into his space to collaborate on prints. And that's something that has to that'll have to continue on because he was very good at it. Eventually, like all garage operations, somebody somebody gets wise and you have to you have to leave. And so <laughs> we moved um, in a harrowing weekend. We were looking around. I mean, we weren't really making any money doing this stuff, um, but we needed a space for these very large machines. And you can see in the back corner of the far picture, there is actually a monotype underneath that sheet there. So we acquired this monotype um, from, an, uh, from a caster down, down south in Redwood City. And this was, uh, you know, couldn't really run it in a garage. So it was about time to leave anyway. And that was really the goal of, of the whole operation was to was to cast type and print books and bind them all in house, um, kind of really traditional, but at the same time not taking not taking ourselves too seriously. But we got got the machines over to the new home in West Oakland, and that's where we've been for three years. Um, it's it's good. It's a crazy old warehouse with leaking roof and um, lots of welding dust everywhere. But it really allowed allowed us to rig up this monotype machine and not have anyone complain or yell at us, which was really integral. And it allowed us to, to make all these books that we have, that I have up here. Um, so that's the, it's the front of the building and the warehouse. It's a six acre warehouse. Um, it's got hundred foot ceilings. It's, it's really wild. We're on a bay with lots of other uh, artists and welders and Burning Man sculpture people. And Right now, there's a there's a robot building company down the way, and so it really does. It's it's good inspiration, and in, in case you need help on machines, it's always good to have. Um, just just some views of inside. It was a slow acquiring when you're dealing with, you know, making books with metal type. You just have to have a lot of stuff, a lot of heavy stuff, even if it's just heavy boxes to store stuff in. It's uh, it builds up, and so for the past couple of years, we've slowly gotten all the toys together. This is the view from up top. We kind of had a built a second story roof up top that we could that we could hang out at and get the view of American Steel on the inside, which was really nice. Um, so I'll just briefly describe just the toys. It was kind of what how we make these books. It's you know it's a lot of big equipment, and uh, we got a lot of this because big equipment generally doesn't uh, find homes as easily as small equipment. And so once. David decided to get that giant Vandercook. I think everything we got tended to be large, and um, but it really did allow us to make to make big stuff, make big books. So that's the, that's David's Vandercook, um, and yeah, it's a beast. It's got rollers that are that big around. I've never seen a letterpress machine with with that big rollers, but it really allows us to make the. Like, it really shines when you're doing large woodcuts or large uh, linoleum blocks. It can lay down an obscene amount of ink, and it's really nice. Um, this is the composition caster. This is like a late model uh, American monotype composition caster. It's hooked up to a computer controlled system. So we have our little MacBook that sits next to it when we cast and that talks to the caster and tells, tells it how to compose text. Um, it really is, it's the book making machine and it's, it's really served, served as well. And just with a handful of uh, kind of traditional American typefaces, we've been able to make the books that we're doing. Um, this is the giant Thompson Platten Press. Um, a few of the books were, were printed on there. I think there's like a romantic side that, that I always had that I always wanted to print books damp on a hand-fed Platten Press, you know, like the grab horn. So this was, you can always try and of course curse, curse the entire way through the process, but it's definitely a workhorse. And that's the only um, kind of job press we have too. So when, when we do take job work or do wedding invites for friends or business cards, it's on this giant press and it's, pretty hysterical to feed a two by three inch business card into that thing a couple hundred times, but it does have to happen. If I had more space, I would have filled it up with another press anyway. Um, we have a, one of the more modern pieces of machinery in the shop is a fancy paper cutter, which was, you know, a big, it was all these like, these toys are all big steps for us along this way. Cause we're just been, we we're broke printers for so many years and we knew that we needed to have a grown up paper cutter and, you know, we really, really prided ourselves in it when we actually bought it. Um, this was my original press that I had in a studio apartment um, in the Presidio. Um, it was the little Vandercook one. It actually came from a, from a place down on Mission, uh, a Latin art center, actually. It came out of the basement there. And 
that's a that actually is in service as a real proof press for the monotype machine, which is was just pretty fun. I did printed me and my wife's wedding invites on it in the apartment years ago, and uh, now it serves the purpose of printing galleys of, of monotype proof and galleys of monotype for corrections. Um, I put this there just because we always love this damn glider trimmer. And when you're working with metal type, making books of metal type, it's indispensable and in the, just the volume of, of lead that we have to deal with. Um, and then a recent hot foil stamper, a lot of everything we, there's a lot of stamping in the past couple of big projects so that it does get its use. And again, it's, it's big, it's bigger than necessary for us, but that's what no one wants. And this is a, uh, just the last family photo. This was at the opening for the Glamour requirement actually in last September, just a month before David passed away. So it's kind of one of the last pictures that we have up there of him. But yeah, that's that's our shop. Um, the books are up, up here. Uh, I could go on about them, but feel free to ask me questions after about the individual projects. Um, I'm moving on to try to finish up these these couple of big uh, book projects in order to tackle a novel that me and David have been planning for about two years now. Um, we're going to do, we're trying to acquire the rights to Charles Bukowski's Ham on Rye, and finally it actually ended up happening um, this summer where we, we got it, and all this was kind of leaning towards, you know, tackling something like a 300-page novel in metal type, um, you know, all printed damp on handmade paper, and just really just do it and kind of showing our chops for the first time, because all these projects were complicated we really wanted to tackle something like serious and really prove ourselves so my goal is to do that in the next year and probably two years I think it'll probably take me double the amount of time but um everything's kind of pushing towards that and so I'm sure you'll hear about the steps in the way but that's what I'll be working on for the next two years in the shop thank you and now Lee Jang of Lemon Cheese Press My name is Lee. I'm the proprietor of Lemon Cheese Press. And yes, you are reading that correctly. And yes, I am food obsessed. Uh, which is how somehow fitting that I ended up at the doorstep of uh, David Goins and Richard Siebert. The dynamic duo has taught me a great deal about food and almost everything I know about printing. The rest of my printing education is due to the thanks of Fred and Barbara Voltmer somewhere. <laughs> uh, I came to Fred and Barbara about five years ago to learn more about the Iron Hand Press and have since then worked on two Havilah Press productions uh, in publications. And um, we're working on our third, or my third at least, and it's a, uh, a, a manual on how to assemble an Albion hand press. And Barbara jokingly refers to that as my thesis. The, quest or drive, I should say, to learn as much as I can about letterpress printing uh, stemmed from a very humbling experience of printing my first book. Peter Platypus was a story written by my husband's late grandmother, and she had written it after retirement. Um, there was talk about getting it published, but nothing ever came of it. I had learned letterpress printing for about a year and was looking for the next project to do and against David Goins's suggestion that perhaps the book was too much too soon, I decided to proceed. About six months and three pages later, I decided perhaps he might be right. But learning letterpress printing for me is about the completion of a printing, of a design process. And so I really wanted to finish the book, uh, if not for my own sake, but then at least to prove David wrong. The book was illustrated in, with linoleum blocks, uh, printed from lead type handset, and we're just using whatever was available at the press at the time. About two years later, I finished the book, finally, uh, and the family was overjoyed. After the book, I embarked on a process of exploration using film as a medium. And by film, I don't mean photographs. Uh, the Film that we use in polymer plate exposures in letterpress printing now is very susceptible to scratches. And so I asked myself, what if these scratches were a little more purposeful? So I started drawing directly onto the film to create artwork. 
something about the traditional technique of drawing and also modern technology really appealed to me. And I experimented with it as much as I could. And it took me about a month to figure out how to do color separations. And about two years later at a colophon dinner, it took Marie Dern of Gar Jungle Garden Press all of 30 seconds to suggest to me and also the same conclusion that I came to that if I use the reduction cut technique, I could register the color separations. So majority of these experiments have uh, resulted in botanical cards and also in uh, landscape drawings. But while printing these things, I started asking myself, what else can I get out of the press? How else can I use the press to my advantage? And perhaps what else can I do to uh, create, recreate the effect of depth of field that you might see in photographs. So these are some of the questions that I hope to address and answer in my next upcoming book called 36 Views of Golden Gate Bridge. These are some early sketches that I'll be showing. So a couple years ago, we went to Paris for the first time. And there I saw uh, Hokusai's 36 Views of Mount Fuji in its first printing and in its entirety and it had a profound effect on me. And for me, the Golden Gate Bridge has a very similar feel in that it is a silent witness to the daily lives of the people in and around the bridge, which was something that Hokusai kind of focused on as well for his book. This book has uh, brought us to some interesting locations that we never knew existed. Like for instance, this one is actually uh, at Kirby Cove. I don't know if anybody know that. It's just on the other side of Marin. If you go down by where the, uh, the outlook is, there's a, actually a campsite and everything. Uh, we never actually were able to bring ourselves to actually camp there because we knew that we would have earplugs in to keep the foghorn away the entire night. But it also brought us um, back to some other locations that we had been and kind of made me really kind of look at them in a different light and see what else I could get from just a view and what other story it can tell. So I'm hoping to have the book finished with Codex, and I hope to see you all there. Thank you. So next we have Super Classy Publishing. Hi, everybody. Uh, Andy Rotner. Uh, I'm one half of Super Classy Publishing. My wife, Katie, is down here. She's the other half of Super Classy Publishing. Uh, as it says up there, we're in Vallejo, California. Uh, Super Classy really started as a name to put on a series of artist books that I'd been doing because when you make books, you need to have a name to put in there. And so we came up with this name. And it really just started out that way. Um, we started from there to do some larger editions with printers and other artists and do some collaborations and from there started to do a lot of commercial work with photographers and bookbinders and things. So from simply a name, uh, this whole series of work and work with other people started. So uh, we're main, I'm mainly going to just talk about a few of our projects. Maybe some of you have seen them over here. Um, see what we have here. So we'll start with our, uh, some of our letterpress projects. I'm going to tell a dirty secret. I am not a letterpress printer. We, we, don't, uh, we don't own any letterpress equipment. So I hope we're not like born out of the room, you know, with people screaming epithets or anything. But uh, I came into this world as, as an artist, and then I was trained as a bookbinder by John Demerit, who is uh, around here someplace I still work with John uh, uh, a little bit. And so if you don't like the binding that you see, you can just blame him uh, later on sometime when you see him. So uh, we'll get started. So uh, this is a project of mine from last year, Knuckles on the Ground, Fundamentals of Book Binding. It was published by San Francisco Center for the Book as part of their 4x4 four four, uh, publication series. Small plates. Small plates, thank you, yes. Um, so this is actually a letterpress project, uh, which was exciting for me. I got to learn a lot. I got to, you know, rock the press with Chad over there at the center, and it was it was a great thing to get to do. Uh, it's a reflection on the brute nature of bookbinding, and it does come from uh, a sort of uh, trope in John DeMeritt's shop where he would always say, 
uh, you know, me just book binder, you know, and kind of like drag his knuckles on the ground. And so from that, I started to do a series of drawings of uh, large apes doing, uh, doing book binding. Uh, so that, that was really, you know, it, it's, it's not more complicated than that. That really is uh, the essence of it. So printed from a polymer plate, uh, the, the, the type is also digitally typeset. Um, and so there's, uh, he's, he's working the press uh, casing in there. And so that was, uh, that was really the whole idea behind that, that project. Uh, just really a, a reflection on the nature of bookbinding, which is, in fact, quite a brute thing in its own way. You know, the other things that he's doing is chopping and, and you know, they, they mostly have this sort of, uh, this sort of brute nature to them. Um, we'll move on to, this is a book called uh, Shepherdess and the Chimney Sweep. Uh, it was co-published by Deeply Game Productions in Sebastopol. This was the first letterpress project we ever did. Uh, all the bindings, uh, this was co-designed with Sarah Press of uh, deeply game. I always tell her she should change the name of her press to the Sarah Press since her name is Sarah Press, but she hasn't done that yet. Uh, in any case, so everything you see here is both designed and bound by me. Not all the printing is by me. Uh, but this is a letterpress over digital project, and it's based on uh, a Hans Christian Andersen story, and it's a retelling by Sarah's cousin. So the backgrounds are 19th century uh, design things that Sarah has this whole collection of that we scanned and used. And then the drawings are actually mine and they're, they're printed from polymer plates over the digital backgrounds. Uh, so we can see a few of those. Uh, we put some big gate folds into it. Um, so you can see one of those there. And you know, this was this was originally we came to this project after it had been conceptualized. It was it was Sarah's project originally, and then we uh, we sort of got involved in it. And and for her, you know, it was really a reflection on uh, the story. The story is the in the original story, um, the shepherdess and the chimney sweep are little figures on the mantle, and they you know they go up and they uh, they see well the the. the the, the chimney sweep, I don't know why I'm telling the whole story in any case. I'm going to forego telling the whole story. Um, in any case, um, it was a reflection on, on, on taking something. Um, anyway, I'm going to move on. I don't really have any great stories about that. Um, we're going to move on to another project of ours. Uh, this is called Manifest Joshua. This was the first project that Katie and I really did together. And it was our first major project that we had done. Uh, we worked with Sarah on uh, the last project. And this was our, our first attempt at really doing it all ourselves. Uh, so uh, this incorporates it's a story that Katie wrote. And then it was letter pressed by Aaron Fong of Western Editions, who I think is also floating around here somewhere else. And then it has a series of paintings that are actually done by the main character of the story. I did the paintings, but we had to do them in a way that uh, Olaf, the man in the story, is not a skilled painter. So we tried to do a series of images that you know, would be aesthetically pleasing, but also would reflect the style of uh, a non-skilled painter. Um, and so it becomes a sort of reflection on American life. There's a, a sort of going west thing. Did anyone know there's a football game that's going on around here? And you'd think you'd have heard about it, but apparently, uh, you know, it hasn't been advertised at all, and there's no <laughs> obstructions or anything. I just heard about this. Uh, and finally, the sort of most ubiquitous of American symbols, uh, the firearm there. So uh, it's a series of reflections about this egg and his various adventures through American life. Um, drawing books. So I do a series of all hand-drawn drawing books. Um, this one is based on a Bob Dylan song, Idiot Wind, from Blood on the Tracks. And I'll sort of move along here through that. Uh, these are editions of three. They're all hand-drawn. I do the same set of drawings three times. Uh, so each one is entirely original, but the content is the same. If you were to see three of them together, uh, you would see that they, they are similar, but uh, entirely unique. So there's a few more of those. Uh, this is Talkin' Hard Work. Uh, it's based on a uh, Woody Guthrie song where a man is doing a series of repetitive tasks to impress his sweetheart. And each page is a task. The number of times he does the task is the number of times I do the drawing on the page. So on the one side, it's 125 drawings. On the other side, it's uh, probably about 14 or 15. Uh, there's another page from that. 
Uh, moving on, so this is based on Edward G. Robinson's portrayal of Barton Keyes in Double Indemnity. It's another one of our drawing books. So this book actually goes both directions, but uh, it's uh, just another one of these uh, books where I was trying to take a pop culture reference or a cultural reference and turn it into an artist book in some way. So there's one more of those. Collaborations, um, a big part of what we do now is working with other artists and publishing the art uh, of other people. So uh, we started working with a comic book artist in New York, Danny White, and he's a wonderful combination of sort of a gruff, uh, kind of like, oh, hey, you know, how you doing, uh, kind of a guy. And then he's also this spectacularly like emotional man who yearns more than any person. He can yearn, I bet, better than anyone in this room. Like, he is just a spectacular yearner. Also, uh, just a lot of very strange uh, references going from the sort of comical to the, to the quite serious, you know, with these refugees. Uh, he's, he's very interested in something that he calls the love war. So you have some soldiers fighting the love war and you have some love refugees there. Um, so uh, in this project, we did, uh, we did a series, we did a special edition that had an original drawing right in the box there. So that loner drawing is actually built right into it. Uh, so that was a, a series of special editions there. We work with the artist Liz Steckety. Um, she is a local photographer, is a colleague of mine at the Art Institute. So this is two volumes of her work that we did in a box. Um, this is a collaging process. These exist as real objects in the world. We scan them and then she is a master digital printer uh, bound and designed in our shop. Um, so Liz is sort of half super mom and half this entirely disturbed mental patient. And we just like love, she's not really a mental patient, but she's like kind of like exudes both those things at the same time. So uh, a lot of her work is this reflection on sickness and health, uh, parenthood, childhood, family photographs, etc. cetera. Um, another book we did with Liz called Nectar, uh, where she's taken portraits of people by her kids and then put them over the faces of actual pictures of those people. So um, there's one, uh, there's one. Uh, all right, so uh, that gets down to uh, our last thing, and I know I've run over time, sorry about that. Um, so we're publishing a new series of artist books uh, this year called 6932, the idea being uh, six, uh, six by nine format, 32 pages, so standard each time, uh, standard printing templates. Uh, and the idea being that we really want to push new content by new artists, uh, not necessarily new artists, but contemporary content uh, with a focus on, you know, short stories, poetry, etc. So this is the first one of those. It's a story I wrote, illustrations by Katie. Uh, it's called Mystic Sand Statistics. And uh, here's just a little couple views of that. Also in its own way, a sort of reflection on sickness. And uh, there's that. And thank you. Uh, that's, that's us. Um, yeah. Brandon C. Chris Duncan. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, so my wife, Maria Otero, is in the back with our kids, and I don't think she's going to make it up here. But um, hi. Um, my name is Chris Duncan, and along with my wife, Maggie, uh, we run Lindsay Press. Uh, we are based oh, wait. We are based in Oakland, California. Um, perhaps some people might recognize that logo as a remnant of the Black Mountain School logo and others might see it as uh, the band The Germs logo. And I think that kind of book ends us rather nicely in what our uh, interests and aesthetics are. Um, we, we, I feel like we champion the notion of a photocopy, and this might make everyone super bummed, but um, <laughs> we, we see it on the same plane as any other more masterful printing technique and uh, tend to build things within with the notion of like making something inexpensive but not cheap, um, and we uh, access a wide range of printing techniques from the photocopy to like working with Kala, to um, I, I teach and I went to school at CCA, 
and able to get into their printing department to sort of build an ebb and flow for a, a pretty wide array of projects um, that we began at the end of 2009. Um, and we started with the idea of like somewhere between like a zine of like maybe more of like subcultural roots that we come from uh, up until like more of a fine art object. And um, started with where we just wanted to make more or less monographs um, with artists that we found interesting. Um, and within that notion of, of um, inexpensive, not cheap, you know, functioning with the, the photocopy um, and with artists uh, thinking about their work uh, through a lens of black and white. Um, and that has kind of taken us on a pretty wild ride. We're up to, I think, 27 editions um, and worked with just as many, if not more, like hundreds of artists at this point. Um, and we make books and avant-garde noise records, and uh, it's pretty fun. Um, it's a labor of love, for sure. Um, maybe I should tell you that um, with the books and records we make, we, um, we make them either an edition of 50 or 100. Um, they're generally perfect bound. Um, they all have this sort of repeated text pattern that occurs um, that you can come and see. And uh, we'll take five of those and then work very like deeply with the artists that we're um, working with to create an artist edition to where then often perhaps letterpress or perhaps like fabrication of boxes or, or, or you know, again, come, come look, um, uh, <coughs> happens in an in, you know, edition of five. So this notion of like, we're really interested in the idea of accessibility, something that I could actually afford to buy versus something that maybe you guys could afford to buy. Um, and yeah, I feel like that's us. We're around and we'd love for you to come see what we got. Uh, thank you so much. Joel Benson of Dependable Letterpress. I'm told I'm pretty soft-spoken, so if anyone can't hear me, just make a thumbs-up noise, and I'll try and be louder. <laughs> um, so let's see. I'm Joel Benson, Dependable Letterpress. I uh, fell into letterpress printing in college. Um, I went to UC Santa Cruz. I was struggling along with uh, classics, uh, philosophy, um, I was a very idealistic young man. <laughs> and then I discovered this uh, printing press in the basement of the dining hall called the Cowell Press and took a class taught by George Kane, who was a used book dealer, who uh, was not a great printing teacher, but he would bring the most beautiful things every week to class to look at and talk about the history of printing in California and in the United States. Um, so that appealed to my romantic side. He um, introduced me to the Yola Boli Press, where I went and apprenticed in 1987. Um, this is a view of the press room and the log cabin that the apprentice stays in. Um, it was a thoroughly saturating romantic experience to go work there. Uh, with Jim and Carolyn Robertson and changed my life. Um, two, two, three or four month sessions up there cemented my commitment to printing. And when the second project ended, I went back to the city and they hooked me up with Julie Holcomb printers in about 1990, I think it was, uh, where I learned commercial trade printing uh, she had the same super high standards of quality, but with this uh, layer on top of commercial, um, commercial viability, I guess. Um, she would say, you know, it's got to be perfect, but we got to get it done in time to meet a deadline or to be able, someone to be able to afford this printing. Uh, so that was a super valuable experience. Um, Oh, I'm not good at multitasking and pushing a button and talking is multitasking for me. Uh, this is my apprentice project at Yola Boli Press, uh, a 
book composed of two limericks and a couplet. Um, that's an interior. I, they had an amazing wood type collection, which I had a great time playing with. Um, this is another book that I've printed more recently. Um, I guess I should jump ahead and say, uh, so I worked for Julie Holcomb for a while, took, took a little break, started my own press in 2002 because I needed to support my family. Um, so looked around and there wasn't a job doing what I wanted to do. Richard Siebert hooked me up with a Vandercook that needed a home. And, and from there I've built my company over the last 13 years. Um, I now have three employees and uh, we do job printing just like what I did for Julie Holcomb. We do tons of business cards and wedding invitations, but I do about two books a year, uh, a handful of poetry broadsides. Um, so this was a book, uh, I think these were ceremonies or spells, I'm not sure. It was for a guy in the East Bay who uh, is an occult publisher He's involved with a bunch of people in, interested in the occult, and he publishes a lot of books to those people, and they buy them. Uh, so uh, in the last six months, uh, in November, in November I moved my shop to a new space. This is the uh, storefront, or the, the building front. It's the American Industrial Center in Dogpatch, this is the former American Can Company building. Um, so behind that roll-up door, we've built a storefront, and we're going to have a gallery space in the front. Um, we've got a 2,500-square-foot print shop behind that. Here's the riggers setting up our presses. And it's a pretty grand space. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. It's a chance to kind of grow with the neighborhood. The neighborhood is getting gentrified rapidly, and I was looking at my rent going up with no upside to me. Um, but the landlord said, well, you should take this space and put a storefront in. And so I took it. I'm hoping it works out. <laughs> um, looking to print more books. Uh, I've got two giant two giant cylinder, well, they're not giant, they're small as far as cylinder presses go, but uh, which are ideally suited for book work. Um, I've got two projects of my own kind of in the works, and I'm hoping those generate interest and bring in more of the outside work that I've been doing. So uh, that's my story. Thank you very much. Finally tonight, Anne-Marie Munn of Ladybones Print Shop. Hi. <clears throat> like Joel, I kind of fell into printing after studying philosophy for four years. Um, I came here to San Francisco to study creative writing at San Francisco State and pursue an MFA. And while I was there, I really realized that I was born to be a printer. Um, <laughs> I come from a family uh, that received many letterpress broadsides in the mail at Christmas time every year of poets, um, mostly from the Bay Area. And so it was always in the air. And when I came into a community of writers, I immediately thought, well, time to start looking at uh, printing and how is this done and what are the mechanics of it. Um, and really fell in love and haven't stopped. I have stopped writing, really. <laughs> um, so I began in the letterpress world um, as an intern at the San Francisco Center for the Book with their imprint small plates division and I printed about four or five uh, artist books, not of my own, but of other artists through that. Um, and then found any work I could in the printing and binding industries for a little while. And finally, um, a Vandercook became available that had belonged to Eileen Callahan of the Turtle Island Foundation. And uh, a teacher of mine, Lisa Rappaport, was helping her to sell it. And I had this call that it's time to buy this, pr 
press. Um, and at the time, I was managing a factory that um, called itself a bindery, and we glued things to other things. And um, <laughs> so I bought this press. We had nowhere to put it. Um, I went in on it with a friend and um, spent about three months trying to find somewhere to place this giant piece of metal. Um, and Lady Bones Print Shop was born. Uh, the name, uh, like the rest of it, is kind of half a joke. Um, it's named after an imaginary girl gang with insatiable appetites, so <laughs> Lady Bones. Uh, anyhow, I eventually, after a couple months printing on the weekends, realized I had to quit my job and do it all the time. Like Joel, I'm a commercial printer. Um, I print mostly job work 90% of the time. And the motto of Lady Bones is really um, this, uh, do what you can with what you have where you are. Um, this is a broadside that's part of a series based on a little manifesto. Cost a dollar, it's made of one sheet of paper. It's called Create Your Own Economy. And it's about how to make a go of it as a unstable economy artist, millennial human with no support network. Um, <laughs> uh, and I actually created this, I had plans to create these broadsides based on the little sayings in the book, but I wasn't executing them. And then I saw um, some really cool broadsides that Mark and Dave were doing on the internet, um, including a really cool one that said, bust a nut, not a union. So I <laughs> said, I have to have that, and I have to meet you guys. I'd been stalking the 3228, the Vandercook that they have. Um, I had the chance to print on it before David bought it, and I really loved that press. <laughs> so I went down to American Steel. I had to not be empty-handed, though, uh, and I really only work under deadline, so I created this broadside to trade <laughs> with David for busting that, not a union. Anyhow, um, in addition to doing job work, I'm still really strongly committed to the writing community and to um, the arts. And so I've begun doing some small publishing. And those are the books that I've brought with me here tonight. All of the books, much like Land and Sea, are produced in two iterations, so um, a trade and a deluxe. All the trade books are between like a dollar and fifteen dollars, and they're photocopied, <laughs> and stapled or singer sewn. And in the um, spirit of inexpensive but not cheap, I do often like to beautify them with either letterpress or foil stamping or some kind of note that elevates the piece. Um, so, that's it. Do what you can, make art, that's all I have to say. <laughs>